is she is a fellow graduate of America's number one ranked public school, the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Well, proud, proud unicorns. Um, so with no further ado, let me get Janora out here and we will get on with the rest of the program. Thank you. The seven talks. You might be wondering, why the number seven? Where does that come from? Is there any significance or reason behind seven? Well, seven is a sexy number. It's also a lucky number. But we are also Moorhead Kane, so we know there's got to be a deeper level to it, some Jedi trick going on just waiting to come out at us. Well, seven is actually the number of fellow Moorhead Kane classes that we had the chance to learn and grow from while we were at Carolina. We had our own class. We had the three classes already there when we arrived. And we had the three classes that followed us. So this idea of the seven talks is all rooted in the power of our cross-class and cross-generational connection. And nobody loved this connection more than our dear Eve Carson, class of 2008. Actually, when the concept of the seven talks came about, Eve was at the heart of the conversation. And if you think about it even more, Eve is literally in the middle of the word seven. S-E-V-E-N. For those of you out there who are unfamiliar with Eve Carson, Take some time this weekend and ask about her. Her story will sadden you, amaze you, and inspire you. And it is in that spirit that we have, not just this morning, but tomorrow morning as well, our seven talks. Seven of our fellow cousins, six alum and one scholar, who will share for seven minutes a story maybe of wit, of wisdom, life lessons, and life experiences. They will go in the order of class years, first starting at the most seasoned, all the way to the youngest. Before we start, we definitely want to thank Bex Frucht, class of 2005. She helped coach our seven speakers, as well as she's gonna be one of the seven tomorrow. We will start with Harvey Kennedy, class of 1974. Now, everyone's bio is in your program, so they will just come out and say their name and their class year, if that. So sit back and relax and enjoy the seven talks. Good morning. Good morning, Moorhead, Kane, alumni, staff, and current scholars. About four months ago, Megan Mazachi asked me to speak at this alumni forum. I told her that it would be a privilege. What I did not know at that time was that a month later, I would be involved in a serious accident which would fracture my left arm, shoulder, and hip. Two months ago, I could not even raise my left hand or arm, nor could I walk. I asked my medical team of physicians and physical and occupational therapists at Wake Forest University, Baptist Health, and Salemtown if I would be able to speak 
in Chapel Hill today. They all told me yes, that they would do their best to get me ready for this speech today. I have so much gratitude to my medical team, which has gotten me to this point. The title of my talk is Carolina Memories and Inspiration. I was a senior at R.J. Reynolds High School in Winston-Salem in 1969-1970. I remember coming to Chapel Hill for the final interviews for the Moorhead Scholarship. At that time, the scholarship was limited to young men. I recall that my interviews went very well with the Central Committee. Archie K. Davis, who was chairman of the board of directors of Wachovia Bank and Trust Company, was chairman of the interview committee. As I left the interview, I was accompanied by Roy Armstrong, who at that time was the executive director of the Moorhead Foundation. He said that he wanted to talk with me briefly. He took me down this long corridor, and when we got to the end of the corridor, he said to me, Mr. Kennedy, I just want to ask you one question. If we offer you the Moorhead Scholarship, will you come to Carolina? I said to him, absolutely, I will come. I remember my first day as a student at Carolina. It was a sunny day with a Carolina blue sky. I was excited about my first day on campus. I did not know what to expect. My first class was a freshman honors English class. As I entered the classroom, I observed the professor sitting at the end of a round table. The class was made up primarily of fellow Moorhead scholars. The professor was wearing a sport coat with holes at his elbows and a pair of shorts. <laughs> his, his hair was uncombed. My first thought was, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> the professor's name was Dr. Forrest Reed, and he was one of the best professors that I ever had at Carolina. The adage that you can't judge a book by its cover proved to be true. I was on the varsity debate team at Carolina. I was contacted by the UNC debate coach, Cully Clark, in the summer of 1970. He asked me and my twin brother, Harold, if we would join the UNC debate team. In high school, Harold and I were on the National High School debate circuit. The National High School Debate Institute at Northwestern University prides itself on accepting the top 100 high school debaters in the United States for an intensive summer program. My brother and I spent a good part of our summer at Northwestern prior to our senior year in high school. At the end of our senior year, we were considered one of the best high school debate teams in the country. In the summer of 1970, we went to a debate boot camp in the mountains of Western North Carolina to prepare for our college debate season. The Carolina debate program was made up of about 11 young men and one young woman. We were a close-knit family. Many of the members of our debate team had been part of the North National High School Debate Institute at Northwestern University. The Carolina debate program became one of the best in the nation. It was headed by our top team, Joe Loveland and Joe McGuire, 
both Moorhead scholars. That team is considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, debate team in the history of college debate. I lived at Granville Towers my sophomore, junior, and senior years at Carolina. I was elected to serve as the representative for Granville Towers in the student legislature for my junior year. I remember the head of the conservative students group asking me, Kennedy, how could you get elected at Granville Towers when less than 1% of Granville was made up of African American students? I told him that it was not about race, but it was about leadership. I told him that my brother and I did not know everyone living at Granville Towers. However, everyone living at Granville Towers knew who we were. <laughs> I spent my senior year at Carolina working primarily on my honors thesis. I was privileged to have so many great history professors. My mentor was Dr. Frank Klingberg, who was an outstanding history professor. At the end of my senior year, I recall my brother going for his interview to defend his honors thesis. When he returned to the dorm, he informed me that he would be graduating from Carolina with highest honors in history. It was then time for me to go for my interview. When I returned to Granville Towers, I told my brother that I would also be graduating from Carolina with highest honors in history. For me, the years I spent at Carolina were four of the happiest years of my life. I made a lot of friends at Carolina. Most of the students I encountered were friendly and kind. Carolina gave me a great sense of confidence. After I graduated from Harvard Law School in 1977, I returned to North Carolina to practice law. I've been involved in the Moorhead Kane Foundation in many ways. I served for many years on the Moorhead Kane District Selection Committee, and in recent years, I've served on the board of directors of the Moorhead Kane Alumni Fund. I would like to close with a story. As a young lawyer in my late 20s and 30s, I fondly recall times when a stately woman would come to our law firm in Winston-Salem. She would meet for four or five hours each time with my mother and father who were her lawyers. But they were much more than her lawyers. They were her advisors and counselors. Her name was Dr. Maya Angelou. Every day that she visited our law firm was a very special day. I want to leave you with these words from Maya Angelou. The thing to do, it seems to me, is to prepare yourself so you can be a rainbow in somebody else's cloud, somebody who may not look like you, may not call God the same name that you call God, if they call God at all. I may not dance your dances or speak your language, but be a blessing to somebody. That's what I think. Ladies and gentlemen, let this reunion begin.
I'm Debbie Harden, and I'm a grateful member of the Moorhead Kane class of 1979. Now, I realize many of you were not born then, so let me take you back in time. We were 54 scholars strong, and for the first time, there were female candidates. Twelve of us, who were instantly dubbed the Dirty Dozen, um, made it through those interviews. But let me tell you, it was also the first time for those Moorhead committees to deal with women. And they were primarily older men. And in the back of their mind, each of them, either subtly or directly through their questions, managed to ask almost all of us, are you serious about a degree, about a career, or are you coming to Chapel Hill for an MRS? And I'll tell you, my 18-year-old, inexperienced, confident self looked at those older men and said, I can do both. I can have a demanding career and a family. Well, unfortunately, they weren't as wise as they thought because they didn't get it that I didn't quite tell the truth. But I believed it at the time. So jump ahead with me, fast forward to 2019. The Moorhead Kane Foundation has a gathering of the Dirty Dozen. It's our 40th anniversary and we're back. And as part of the weekend, we meet with the current scholars in a panel format. Once again, I'm in the halls of the Moorhead building. I've always loved that building. And I hear that same question from a young scholar that haunted us so many years before. Can you really both handle a demanding career and have a family? And if so, please tell us how. <laughs> well, let's just say with 40 years of experience, I didn't give that group of scholars the same answer that I had that older group of committee members. So let me just give you a brief glimpse into my past as to what shaped the new answer. I've been a practicing lawyer for 40 years. My husband, Mark, and I are celebrating our 40th anniversary. And we are the proud parents of three children. It has been a fulfilling life, but not always an easy one. For the first 10 years of our marriage, we devoted ourselves to building our relationship and our careers, two very demanding careers. 10 years later, finally, we were fortunate to have our son, and we were ecstatic. And you know what? We kind of figured it out with one child because we, as double Tar Heels, could play man-to-man -man defense. We understood that. <laughs> and we could trade off. But 28 months later, we were given premature twins. And all of a sudden, our man-to-man -man defense days were gone. We were in that zone, and all of us true Tar Heels know there's always a weakness in every zone defense. <laughs> so what did we do? Well, we had a nanny, but we hired our nanny a part-time sitter, and we backed her up with other helpers, and we committed ourselves to trying to do the best we could with our very young family. So finally, I return to work. I've been a partner now for a few years, and it's my first trial after having the twins. Come with me to this federal courthouse. Imagine you're sitting in the courtroom. You're finally back. I've landed a new client. I've got the general counsel beside me. I got the chairman of the board in the witness stand, and I've got the CEO coming up next. I am back. I got this. I can live up to that 1975 promise. And all of a sudden, from the back of the room, a note is passed to me. And I open it, and that note says, Nanny's sick. 
can't take care of children, need help. So what are you going to do? Once again, we have planned, we have tried, we have backed ourselves up, but that's a difficult choice for a young mom. As the lawyers in this auditorium know, in the middle of a trial, the lead trial counsel's greatest gift is confidence from the client. What are you going to do? You're going to sit there and tell your client that you're going to walk out the door? But as a young parent, are you going to leave your kids without proper care? So, it's with those types of experiences that I answer the question in 2019 in the Moorhead Halls. And my answer this time is not definitely, it's maybe. But you're going to have to have three things if you're both going to try to manage a demanding career and have a family. Number one, know there's going to be sacrifices. Sacrifices by you and by your spouse, and sometimes, unfortunately, by your children. Secondly, you have to have support. And for me, my most important support came in the form of my spouse, who wanted to be an active part of his children's life, and who more importantly supported my decision and my choice to try to have it all. And third, is support from your, fir your firm, your career, your partners. You cannot do it alone. Don't try. But the most difficult thing is the compromise you have to realize and accept for yourself. Each of us in this room, I bet, share a sense of being the best. You must or you are not satisfied. But let me tell you, you cannot be the best every moment of every day in what you do. You have to accept something less than the best. And in the words of one of my best friends and my law partners, you've got to learn, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. Okay, this is officially scary. Um, I'm frank, but I want to talk to you, at least for starters, about a friend of mine named David Tatel. He's someone I met about five years ago. He's a retired judge, but when I met him, he was still on the bench. He was a judge with the, I don't always get this right, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Washington, D.C. District. It's a pretty dense and daunting proper noun, but basically, it is the court just shy of the Supreme Court. It's probably the primary feeder court for the Supreme Court. Many justices on the Supreme Court have been elevated from that court. In other words, David Tatel had reached the pinnacle of his profession, and he was blind. He, uh, he had been blind since he was about 30, but many of the lawyers who argued cases before him never knew that or didn't know that at the time. He had so mastered his environment that you couldn't tell. When he was on the bench and lawyers were arguing before him, he would move his head to the sounds of their voices as if he was looking at them. He would walk to and from the bench, to and from his chambers, without ever seeming to need assistance because he had memorized his physical environment so well. I got to know him pretty well over the subsequent years. Whenever I would go down to DC from New York for work, I would take some time and I would go talk to David in his chambers. Um, I would sometimes have dinner with him and his wife, Edie. And one evening, we were leaving the courthouse to travel the eight miles to his Washington, D.C. home to meet Edie, who was cooking for us. Um, and I said to him, okay, so um, I should now get an Uber or hail a taxi or call a Lyft or something, because I figure, how does, a, how does a blind man get home from work? And he said, no, 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 we'll take the metro. And I thought, well, of course, we'll take the metro because I'm here. He's going to grab my arm. I'm going to guide him. Wrong again. He pretty much did it on his own. I was walking alongside him. I was walking behind him. He had learned over the years, using his memory, using sound, 
to do all the things that someone else did with sight. He knew the number of steps from one street corner to another. He knew the number of steps from that street corner to the next one. He could use his hearing to figure out and he, to, to listen to traffic and the footfall of other people and figure out when it was safe to cross the street. So I just followed along and he led me to the metro and he led me into the metro and through the turnstiles and to the exactly right platform. And when the car came from his memory of the surroundings, from the sounds of the doors opening, from where he could sense other people were, he knew where and when to enter the train. And my sole contribution was to look for an empty seat and guide him toward that. Something that strangers typically did for him if he didn't have someone like me around, because he did this by himself all the time. And as we sat down, I knew him well enough to know I could say something to him without sounding condescending or patronizing. I said, David, I, I can't believe what I just saw. You are, you are such an inspiration that you can do all of that on your own. And he said to me, Frank, starfish can regrow limbs, but that's nothing compared to what human beings can do. He had just shown me that. He was proof of that. And I needed to hear that because I haven't told you why I met David Tatel. I was introduced to him weeks after I had a rare stroke that destroyed the vision in my right eye, weeks after I was told that I would never recover vision in that eye and that there was a 20% chance the same thing would happen to my left eye a 20% chance that I would go blind. Good odds, really high stakes. Um, how do you live with that? What you do is you educate yourself. You educate yourself about what other people who have been dealt surprises like that and confronted limits like that, what they've done to adapt, what they've done to transcend those limits. You educate yourself about what people are capable of because that may well be what you're capable of when the situation demands it. So do you know that one of the most celebrated, if not the most celebrated, and popular and best-selling British travel writers of the early 1800s was a blind man? His name is James Holman, and I can't believe his legend isn't larger than it is, and we don't all know his name. Um, he lived in an era when there was no commercial air travel, no cars and highways. Um, he traveled by ship. He traveled by horseback, by horse-drawn carriage. And he went from Britain to Asia, to Africa, to South America, to Australia. In fact, he traveled, he went to all those places and wrote about them based on what he heard, based on what he heard in the environment, the stories that people told him, based on uh, smell, based on touch. He brought these places to life without ever having seen them with his eyes. And he, in fact, logged many multiple times the number of miles that Marco Polo did. So if there was any justice in the world or in the world's swimming pools, children wouldn't say Marco to hear Polo. They'd say James to hear Holman. <laughs> James Holman was a starfish. I met and got to know a man who was working as a sound engineer at a very high level of the music industry when a rare cancer destroyed the hearing in one of his ears. He figured that might be it for his profession. His ears were his everything. But he didn't lose hope. He hung in there. Uh, he tried and tried, and his brain performed an amazing trick. And he found himself able eventually to do with one ear what you were supposed to need two to do. He could hear in three dimensions. He could hear which direction sound was coming from. And he tells me he thinks he's better at his job today than he was before. He's a starfish. One of the most accomplished open water marathon swimmers in the world is a woman who didn't try to do that until she was about 30 years old. And she didn't do it until she had a horrible accident that, her, that mangled one of her legs so badly, doctors told her they thought they were going to have to amputate it. it. Took her two years to learn to walk again. And looking for a new source of exercise, looking for a new source of confidence and strength, she took to the open water. And within a matter of years, she became the first woman ever to swim the 30 infamously dangerous miles from an island off San Francisco through shark-infested waters to the Golden Gate Bridge. She's a starfish. She didn't regrow a limb, she grew fins. There is, scientists used to believe, uh, not so long ago, we're talking about just a couple decades ago, um, that our brains sort of stopped growing or developing or doing much that was important after a certain age, that we got a sort of fixed amount of good stuff up there and we burned through it at a constant clip and that was that. In recent decades though, they realized, no, they were totally wrong. We generate new neurons 
well into old age. We make new synaptic connections. I don't have the exact scientific and medical vocabulary for this, but basically, we never stop learning and changing and adapting. There's a name for this school of belief in this, in this uh, area of medicine. It's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity basically says we are all starfish. And that is such an important lesson to keep in mind as you age or when you're young and you're a student because it's a lesson in infinite possibility. David Tatel, James Holman, the sound engineer I introduced you to, the marathon swimmer, you, me, starfish, all of us. What an incredible source of consolation and what a generous and deep wellspring of hope. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Among its many impacts, the COVID-19 pandemic has centered the problem of diminishing public trust in medical experts and concerns over the role of power in politics, in science, medicine, and public health. For many, these issues are deeply alarming. In April, for example, I ran across a headline lamenting the ruinous effects of the politicization of public health agencies such as the CDC. But in these seven minutes, I want to open with you a different conversation about the relationship between medicine and politics. I want to share why embracing what I see as the inherent political nature of medicine has inspired my career. I teach sociology of health and medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. My classes focus on the political dimensions of public health interventions, past and present, political dimensions of our healthcare system, and of medical knowledge. I ask my students, many of whom are on a pre-med track, to consider how medicine has been leveraged by some to maintain social power and privilege, and how it might be leveraged to challenge social inequality. Similarly, I encourage my students to think about why some seeming moonshots, like mapping the human genome, become national scientific projects, while other challenges, like ensuring clean air and clean water, do not. In short, my goal is to motivate students to recognize medicine and public health as sites of struggle for social justice and to be open to engaging with that struggle. I know this is a complex issue, Lack of public trust in the CDC and political struggles over the agency's regulatory decisions have cost human lives over the course of the pandemic. But the answer is not to try to isolate medicine and public health from politics, social influence, or controversy. Nor does history suggest that such, such isolation is possible. One of the examples I share with my students is the Black Panther Party's health activism in the late 1960s and 70s, documented in the book Body and Soul by Alondra Nelson. While the Black Panthers are more often remembered for encounters with law enforcement, Nelson's book examines how the party mobilized around the idea of health as a human right, demanding improved healthcare access, the separation of medicine and market imperatives, and a shift in the balance of power between clinicians and their patients. Across the nation, collaborating with left-leaning medical activists, the party built a network of people's free clinics. They established a clinical culture in which mostly white providers studied authors like Franz Fanon to better grasp the relationship between oppression and health and a clinical culture in which black patients were empowered not only to demand respect from and to question their providers, but also to take medicine in their own, into their own hands, offering blood pressure screening, performing pap smears across their communities. As the case of the Panthers suggests, in the United States and beyond, there's a history of social movements that have productively targeted medical knowledge and practice. We just often aren't taught that history. A second example I share with students illustrates a different kind of politics. 
in this case, how national political agendas can transform scientific practice. In her book, Exposed Science, Sarah Shostak investigates why the field of toxicology shifted away from its original focus on identifying toxins in the ambient environment, turning increasingly inward, concentrating deep inside the human body on DNA. With this, the question of how particular genetic predispositions influence individual susceptibility to toxins moved from the periphery to the center of the field. Further, rather than disease prevention, this new emphasis on genetic predisposition meant toxicology shifted toward clinical research, a research that could contribute to treating and curing disease once an individual was already sick. So why this change in toxicology? Scientists explained to Shostak that as the US government boldly committed itself to mapping the human genome, they found the distribution of power and money within the National Institutes of Health increasingly dependent on engagement with the promise of genetic and genomic science. Environmental scientists shifted to focus on DNA in no small part out of self-preservation from a funding perspective, not because this necessarily made for good science. My own research focuses on the politics of diabetes prevention in Mexico, specifically the different sets of social actors who have ha had influence over the kinds of prevention efforts that have been ad adopted. Working primarily in Mexico City, I follow closely groups of activists who have mobilized in street protests and lobbied Congress to institute and maintain a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. They name names, assigning blame for the country's chronic disease crisis to companies like Coca-Cola and Nestle. I compare their demands to focus prevention efforts on food policy reform with those of elite entrepreneurs increasingly engaging in health philanthropy in Mexico. These philanthropists have promoted tech-based solutions to the diabetes epidemic, like apps that individuals can use to access and monitor their diabetes risk from their smartphones. And it's these elites who enjoy easy access to policymakers, pushing an agenda of tech-empowered individual responsibility rather than taking the processed food industry to task. Both groups are pursuing prevention. Both are working for better health outcomes in Mexico, but they are doing so based on an entirely different set of political commitments and vision for what the Mexican state's role is in supporting a right to health. As these cases show, rather than being ruinous for medicine or an anomaly during COVID-19, politics and medicine are inextricably intertwined. My teaching and research centers this fact not to diminish the authority of medicine, but instead to imagine ways that it might be continually and increasingly enlisted in struggles for equity. Thank you. How are we doing? The first time I visited the metaverse, I was 12. My dad upgraded our dial-up modem, and I was connecting from Nebraska to America online. I begged for months to join the revolution sweeping the nation, and at last, I got mail. The early internet was slow, but it was alive. Instant Messenger was the new agent of human connection, one that got killed when my mom picked up the phone. <laughs> I learned to type quickly to get my thoughts out because I could ride them beyond the edges of Omaha, exploring infinite knowledge. That proto-metaverse, the first immersive, persistent digital market of ideas captured all of my attention and grew into the gigantic multi-sensory social ecosystem we now live in. Now, rather than get kicked off when I picked off the phone, I fall straight down into it. Our internet, the live streaming global engine of 
dance moves has revolutionized culture while addicting us to the most sophisticated dopamine triggers ever engineered. We read and write, expressing opinion with every click, seeing more of what we like and less of what we don't. Billions use it. We can't live without it. It's everywhere, always on, until it's not. In the past year, governments in 34 countries have shut down the internet 182 times to silence dissent. The more we value things outside our control, the less control we have. So where do we go from here? The year I graduated from Carolina, a paper was published that introduced Bitcoin. Of its many innovations, it solved for what's known as the double spend problem. In cashless economies, a validator is needed to confirm that a digital token is not being spent over and over. Typically, a bank does this, verifying the money is there and then transferring, but banks can close down. The paper described a trustless, cryptographic, secured network of computers that work together to verify transactions. This is the blockchain, a decentralized ledger designed to be unassailable and immutable. Supporters in this network are incentivized and rewarded with tokens that store value. And even though we already had a good system for file sharing in BitTorrent, torrents weren't great at storing value because like most computer files, they can be copied. Bitcoin's other major shakeup was introducing digital scarcity. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins. This is governed by math that rewards these tokens until they run out. Their value defined by a free market rather than a central bank. So on my birthday 12 years ago, a guy traded 10,000 Bitcoin for two large pizzas, pricing a Bitcoin at half a penny. Today, after decades of consensus, that dinner would cost $200 million. <laughs> Bitcoin was made to store value. What it wasn't built for is proving how cool you are. For that, you still needed Lamborghinis. So a few years later, this cool guy and his friends invented a new blockchain called Ethereum. Ethereum can execute lines of code based on certain criteria. They turned the blockchain into a computer and started building apps called smart contracts. From digital gold, we now had an internet computer, and that meant banks without bankers, exchanges without Wall Street, businesses with millions of equal partners. And along the way, we discovered that blockchains could authenticate anything. Art, concert tickets, collectibles, even identity through NFTs. A non-fungible token is unique. It's made to convey ownership of something legit. The token points to a unique item and says, that's real and this guy owns it. In ancient England, the Saxons sought to kidnap the sororal nephews of rival kings rather than their sons. And the rationale was that the king's nephew was more likely to be a member of the ruling family because the king's sister was blood and the queen might have a side piece. Art historians call this provenance. We assume the Mona Lisa is authentic because the Louvre says so. The first time I heard about art NFTs, I thought, why can't I just right click save this thing? Because without that token, I couldn't prove how it was mine or why or since when. Human interaction is all about emotion. I can tell you that there's tech that makes Web3 revolutionary, but there is a magic that can't be explained when you have a relationship of the mind with a member of your tribe who selected and embodied a character with the same finite collection as you, bound by that scarcity and story. You explore your shared fears and wonder without ever knowing their name, but in seeing their transparent actions, the honesty of their commerce, on an open ledger. Know that the artifice and posturing of life can fall away in this space to reveal the secrets of who they really are. It's Cars and Coffee, it's Comic Con, it's alumni forums on the grandest scale. Web3 is the next evolution of human interaction. When you buy a house, you're watched over by a signature wizard called a notary 
who asserts the validity of your agreement with a rubber stamp. Last week, somebody sold a house through an NFT, replacing the wizard and bank and the stamp with one click. We're witnessing a cultural and technological renaissance in every sector of life. The unbanked have upward mobility through DeFi. Scientists are building capital in shared wallets to invest in issues pharma won't touch, like longevity and psychedelics. Children's hospitals are receiving charitable donations in perpetuity for the sales of donated digital art. All of this is happening today without permission because blockchains tell the truth. When we reduce the friction of mistrust in our lives, we can be more present. If we stop debating what happened, we can solve problems together. We are already members of the best club in the world, but we meet so rarely. So to help you join me as we build the new internet, you're all getting a seed, a free token of my love for this room that I promise we can grow into something of purpose if we do it as one. So get out your phones, open your cameras and scan the code and then put them away in honor of the next speaker. I'm here all weekend to help you set up your wallets and mint the memory of how it feels to be together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, I see some movement. Before I start, I wanna just share that I'm gonna be talking about fertility in a, uh, in a bit. You'll be seeing myself give, me, give myself injections. So if it's triggering for anyone, I, I totally understand. If you wanna get up and excuse yourselves, that's completely fine. So when I got asked to give a seven talk, I thought, why me? <laughs> what am I gonna talk about? What story do I have to share? I'm not a CEO. I'm not a published author. I'm certainly not the governor of North Carolina, so couldn't they just call him? But then I thought about the essence of seven and I thought about Eve Carson and specifically I thought about um, three days prior to her untimely death or two days prior to her untimely death, I sat with her at a Moorhead dinner. And I thought about how we talked and we shared and we talked about our lives and who we are as individuals, she a white woman, me a black woman. And um, I thought about what I would tell her now. I'm, you know, what would I share with her now? So this is, this is what I thought about. For me, 24 was the number. I was gonna be married, I was gonna have kids by 24. Fast forward 10 years, I'm 34 now. I have no kids, I do not have a partner, and I don't really have plans to have kids in the next, in the next couple of years. But what I do have is I have a couple of eggs sitting in a cryogenic um, storage facility. And so last year I started thinking about child rearing and the timeline we as women face. And I, I, was think, I had asked a couple of friends, I said, you know, have you thought about this? And some of them said, yeah, you know, I thought about it. I'm planning on having kids. And I thought about how easily friends got pregnant growing up. You know, no problems, everything was an accident. Um, but then as I thought about, you know, getting older, I was like, okay, some of my friends are starting to plan on having families and they're, they're thinking about, you know, starting, uh, having, getting pregnant. And some of them are having trouble. And fertility wasn't a thing that came as easily. I started having friends who were using the term geriatric pregnancy. And I was thinking, what does that mean? Like, we're, we're in our 30s. And so I, I learned that a geriatric pregnancy, though an outdated term, is when a woman has a, um, gets pregnant after the age of 35. And, that, and they're considered high risk after the age of 35. And I just kept thinking, wow, that's, that's really young. And as I learned in my research that geriatric pregnancy is an outdated term, so do not use that term anymore. We actually say advanced maternal age. <laughs> advanced at 35. So I knew women were born with a fixed number of eggs, right? So that number decreases as we get older, okay. And, but I, what I didn't know is that the remaining eggs that, that we have start to potentially face issues. They might have abnormal chromosomes that could affect the viability of the egg or even um, the health of the child. So cue the anxiety. At 33, as I said, I have no partner. I have no plans to have kids. 
I started to feel angst. What if I get married and I want to have kids and I can't? What if I don't get married and I want to have kids and I can't? Am I going to be too late? It was like someone turned on a timer and it just started ticking every single day in my head. And every time I saw a mother or a child or someone pregnant, it was getting louder and louder and louder. So at that point, I started to do some more research. I started talking to friends and a few of them had learned about this egg freezing thing. I knew that people were talking about it. I had some friends that had completed the process and I was surprised at how many people knew about this quote, fountain of maternal youth that I had and hadn't shared publicly. So I decided I would share publicly. First, I called my mom and I told her. My mom's been in the healthcare industry for her entire career. She's a nurse, she teaches nursing. And neither of my parents had ever pressured me to have kids. They always said, you know, live your best and fullest life, whatever path that takes you on, great. Grandkids, cool, if not, fine. But when I called my mom, she was easily on board. Great, this is awesome, cool, <laughs> excited. Next, I share with my dad. And now on the phone, my dad says, okay, baby, that sounds wonderful. I have since learned he immediately hung up the phone and called my mom and said, has she lost her love for loving mind? <laughs> so he asked all the questions. Is this safe? Is she going to be able to cover the cost for this and everything? And I knew that what he really wanted to do was be 100% supportive to me on the phone. So he just knew he would call my mom. Then I decided that I would tell all my friends on social media. And that's when it started to dawn on me the idea of maternal health and specifically black maternal health. People asked a number of questions in my DMs. They asked me, is it, you know, how much does it cost? Is your insurance covering it? What if you have complications? What if, you know, you find out you have some genetic, you know, factor that you don't know about? A lot of questions and a lot of fear came up. And a lot of fear, obviously, from a lot of my black friends as black maternal health is something in a field that has been distrusted and disregarded as you think about women who have had faced issues. We know about Beyonce. We know about Serena Williams. But what about me? So after my initial appointment, oh, sorry, to back up, I then decided that I would share with, because a lot of them asked, can you continue to share your details? I want to know how this progresses on your journey. So I decided to share those as videos that will show um, behind you, but support inf inf informative videos for my friends. Didn't expect to be sharing this with you all today, so here we go. Um, after my initial appointment, my doctor says, you know, it's great. You have, you're a great candidate. You have a number of eggs for freezing, which on one hand is a good thing, but on the other hand could be a symptom of PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome. PCOS affects one in 10 women of childbearing age and can cause high levels of androgens and many cysts on the ovaries. While my rare and high egg count was not a result of PCOS, I enjoyed doing the research and being able to inform friends about PCOS. When the medicines arrived at my house, the process got very real. <laughs> I started the day after Thanksgiving last year, and while I was confident that I could administer the shots on my own, I asked a friend over for moral support. Using a syringe, I drew up the saline, and I mixed it with the powder that came in the little vial and injected that into my stomach. I then used the ready jet pin to turn the dial and get the appropriate amount, and then injected that to my, into my stomach as well. Luckily, I had a couple of friends who had done IVF, and they suggested that I alternate sides to keep the soreness down from, from the injections. The first week, I went to the doctor's office every other day to have blood work and an ultrasound. In the office, while it was super inviting and the staff was multicultural, there was something that was a little off every time I went in. And what I realized is that subconsciously, as I was looking at the promotional materials and the marketing materials, there were no black babies and no black mothers. And so subconsciously, I was asking myself, can I be a success story? But it really made me double down on my, my need to tell people about this journey that I was on. So after the first seven days, the doctor started to change some of the dosage. On one particular night, I needed to take half of a dose. And I took astrology as my science with a lab at Carolina. <laughs> so I needed to reach back all the way to like 10th grade chem chemistry to figure out how the half the dosage of this pre-field vial. So, about eight YouTube videos, two calls to my mom, a call to fellow Moorhead scholars, Jessica Lynch, who had done this process, um, and a few prayers later, I was able to administer the appropriate dosage, and the next day, the lab showed that my follicles were growing and that I had done something right. So, at some point, I started to become very cognizant of my ovaries. Never really felt my ovaries before. It's all been great. But I started to feel a bit bloated in days like walking around, bending over, doing normal activity. I started to notice they were noticeably larger. 
So I went to the doctor, and of course he says, well, this is something called kissing ovaries. Your ovaries are actually large enough that they're touching one another. Um, he suggested that I take it easy the next couple of days, no more walking around in the Philadelphia streets, and so I, I did as he suggested. The day before the retrieval, my mom came to town. So I thought this was really special um, to have my mom there as I took the next step of me potentially coming, becoming a mom in the future. The surgery was only about 45 minutes. I needed someone to drive me home after the anesthesia. That evening, the doctor called me and said that I had 26 eggs um, that he was able to extract, and 24 of those were viable. Now, if you remember in the beginning, I said 24 was the number that always was in my head. So it was very ironic and in a sense kind of um, full circle that I uh, am able to have 24 eggs on ice and to, when I decide to use them, I can use them. I know that my biological clock is still ticking, but I also know that I was able to find freedom through my fertility journey and hopefully give you all some insight as well. Thank you. A couple days before the start of my senior year this August, I was stuck in my thoughts. Thoughts about the past three years, my summer in Los Angeles, a post-grad job offer I had just accepted, and my final school year ahead. And my contemplation was rooted in questions such as, am I doing enough? And in the things I'm doing, am I contributing meaningfully? And simply, am I enough? So I went to my mom, as I often do when I get stuck, and for context, my mom and I are really close. She is the first person I turn to for dating advice. That's how close we are. Um, but I have a complicated view of her in that she and my dad moved our family from Seoul, South Korea to Raleigh, North Carolina, leaving behind everything they had and everyone they knew in the hopes that my brother and I would do better than they did which I held as a common hope among immigrant parents, but also as any parent's hope for their child. So I carried an overwhelming obligation to make my parents' immigration, their sacrifices, their pain worthwhile. I had to make my parents only seeing their mothers once in a decade worth it. I had to make my mom missing the death of her father worth it. I had to make all of their graveyard shifts, their small and big sobs and heartache in this country and as working parents, all of it, everything, worth it. And this was concurrent to my other mission in life to prove my nuance, worldliness and worth to myself and everyone else. So back to the story, I'm with my mom in her bed, and I'm telling her that even though I met amazing people this summer, built cool things, and now I have this job for after graduation, I still feel so lacking, restless, and scared that I have to do more, but don't really know what it is I have to do. Then my mom gently starts sharing this Korean proverb about a frog in a well. And in this proverb, a happy little frog is content within the walls of its well, clueless to what's outside. But one day, a visiting sea turtle tells this frog of the great, big, blue, beautiful expanse of the ocean. And the frog is then suddenly ashamed, crafting these new requirements to be happy and restless to leave and find its worth in the world outside. And my mom proceeds telling me that this proverb is used in Korean to encourage people to seek the experiences, networks, and places that expand their worldliness, nuance, and worth. And I'm thinking, okay, mom, you know, I get it. I'm the little frog in the well, ribbit, rabbit, you know. But I did relate to this frog. I moved to Raleigh when I was six, and I'm in the beginning while a Jason's Deli cheesy baked potato was the most marvelous thing in the world, something that I thought I was born to just eat. Um, by my fifth baked potato, the marvel of my town in Raleigh wore off. You know, I soon knew all the bends of the roads. I could locate 
any item at my local Harris Teeter within 15 seconds. And I had never missed a Sunday in my 13 years attending the first Korean Baptist church by my house. And as I got older, reading the books of Korean American authors like Chang Rae Lee, who was brought up at Exeter and went to Yale, I was intensely aware and ashamed of being in my well, specifically the working class Korean community of Raleigh. I was restless to leave. Then the Moorhead Kane came along, and Anne visited me at my high school and knighted me as a scholar. And while I couldn't be in the Northeast, where I thought culture lived, um, <laughs> it, it provided me an opportunity to metaphorically keep one foot in the well, but also literally, because the old well is right outside, right? Um, while using the financial support to safely venture out and, and find my worth, finally, through the summers and the Lovelace Fund for Discovery. Um, so that's what I did. You know, I went to Seoul, Los Angeles, Alaska, interned across sectors, traveled, met people in, in the top of their fields, anything and everything to see this greater world and to finally claim my worldliness, nuance, and worth. But while I was at these places, doing the things, meeting the people, I still felt like that damn restless little frog simply incapable of meeting the unclear, yet increasing requirements to be content with myself. Then my mom snapped me out of my reflections by asking me, okay, so then what happens when the frog finally leaves the well? And I said, I don't know, you know, what happened? I'm sick of this metaphor, uh, <laughs> you know? But, but she said something so unexpected that the frog isn't any happier, but is overwhelmed by the endless things to do and see, and is now striving to overcome and, and be the best at everything all at once. And it's still deriving its worth from the world around it, when really, the frog's worth as a frog and, and its capability for happiness was within the frog all along. And she's saying all of this, and I'm just sobbing so ugly, you know. Like, uh, and um, because here's my mom, you know, who, for whom I thought I had to work twice as hard as my peers to prove not only that her daughter was worthwhile, but that her pain and her sacrifice was worthwhile. But she continues on saying that even if I had never gone to school and I had stayed to work at my dad's restaurant in Raleigh, that I would have been just as worthy. That even if I had gone up north to a school that my grandmothers in Korea could have more easily bragged about to their friends <laughs> during poker, you know, I would have been just as worthy. And that her only hope for me in her duty of love, which manifests in her lifetime of sacrifices for me, is not that I would do better than she did, but that simply that I would know my worth as always being within me, inextricably and unconditionally mine, and in that it will always be mine, unrelated to the experiences, networks, and places that I had been chasing my whole life. And, and since that evening in August, you know, as I'm still trying to take that in, I find that the gradual lifting of those burdens propels me to pursue the experiences, networks, and places, not in fearful obligation anymore, but out of gratitude. Gratitude to my maker, gratitude to my family, gratitude for the privileges that I hold, the opportunities such as this that I have been given. And now I can see these experiences, networks, and places, not as the source of my innermost worth, but as chances to help shed light onto what's already within me. So I leave you with all of this in humility and gratitude, acknowledging that this room contains some of the biggest achievers and strivers that I will ever know. That from the moment you simply came to be, you were worthy. All you have to do in life is walk in that.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, I'm Madhu Volamiri, class of 2014, and I'm honored and privileged to be one of your co-chairs for this 2022 Moorhead Kane Alumni Forum, along with my partner in crime for the weekend, Brian Strong, class of 2000. I'm sure that, uh, like me, you all were humbled, uplifted, intrigued, and inspired by these amazing talks. And Brian and I would like to ask our phenomenal seven speakers to please join us again on the stage for one final round of applause. Please join us. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I think we can all agree, agree how inspiring that was this morning. Um, uh, suffice it to say, I was slightly less inspired at 7 a.m. Uh, today. And uh, for the second forum in a row as co-chair, I, uh, I chose the path of another kind of self-care and, and did not get myself out of bed this morning for the 5K Uncle Mott Trot. Um, I, I sat in my bed at the Carolina Inn and watched Premier League soccer and watched other people run around <laughs> while the overachievers that I have in my hand here were out in the 40 degree cold running um, in the spirit of physical vigor, obviously, um, which is an important pillar of the tradition of this program. Um, so uh, all jokes aside, uh, we are excited to announce the top three male and female finishers of the 5K run this morning. Um, there's a gift card in here for each of you. Excited? Um, all right, so third place male, uh, Joseph Hinchcliffe. Oh, a lot of Joseph fans in the room. I love that. Class of 2025, a Welshman in a time of 18 minutes, 33 seconds. Congrats, Joseph. Uh, I don't know if you want to pop up here. We'll find you later. Oh, okay, we'll find you later. How's about that? <laughs> the second place male. Ah, a fellow Charlottean, Grant Heskemp, uh, class of 2014, in a time of 1833.2. Oh, that was close, huh? Joseph and Grant. You guys were a tenth of a second off. All right. In first place, to Joe Nail, Dodge City, Kansas, class of 2018, with a time of 1828. Congrats to you. All right. To the top three female finishers. Uh, from Aspen, Colorado, class of 2020, Lizzie Rustler with a time of 2140.8. And again, Lizzie and Megan will have a, it sounds like they were right, uh, right next to one another here. Uh, second place female, Megan Harrington, Farnham, England, class of 2023, 2140.6. And the first place female, Last but not least, Olivia Romine, Greensboro, North Carolina, class of 2023, 2029. And if you don't mind, would the six of you at very least just stand up so we can recognize you 
Oh. Come on, come on. You'd think I'd be good at this by now, but. Gentlemen. Joe? Grant? And the other Joe. Thank you. Olivia, without your name tag. Check your name. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Um, and will we just find Megan and Lizzie later and we'll hook them up? Thank you. Um, and congrats to all of you again. Um, now, without further ado, the real professional, Janora McDuffie, will be back out here to um, get everybody sent over to the panels this afternoon um, and get you on your way. Thanks, everybody. I mean, we learned we are starfish, we got NFTs. I am just so full and overflowing. Um, what a wonderful morning. Okay, but as Brian says, this is just the beginning of the day. So my job right now is to make sure that we know where we are going next and are all in line. So with that, it is probably gonna take you a little bit of time to think and find your panel. So here is the list right now. As I take out this microphone, look up here and find which panel you're going to go to. And definitely take note if it's in the green zone or the orange zone. When you get to the student union, look for these colors as the entrance. The green zone entrance is going to be across from Davis Library. And the orange zone entrance is going to be across from the pit. Also, when you get there, there will be scholars and folks with that Ask Me button just in case you get lost on the way. All right. Also, one thing that will help you find these panels is the QR code that we're about to pop up here for the app. So it's not another NFT, but it is <laughs> what's going to lead us into our schedule the entire weekend. So make sure if you have not done that, do so right now. In terms of the panel,